Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Ventures Podcast. This conversation with Jonathan Hung is wide ranging. He is a founder, he's a venture capitalist, he's an LP in a whole bunch of different funds. We talk about Web3, current market conditions, how to think about the current market as an entrepreneur and as an investor and as an LP. Uh, there's so much wisdom packed into this conversation. I couldn't be more excited to share it with you. So, if you're watching, you can also listen anywhere you get your podcast. You can just search for Ventures and it should show up. And if you're listening, you can also watch by visiting wclittle.com. There I'll have more extensive show notes of the different things that we talk about today. So with that, please enjoy this conversation with Jonathan Hong. All right, Jonathan, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you, Will. So last number of uh, episodes, we've been talking about Web3, venture building, venture investing, lots of entrepreneurial stories, examining different market landscapes. And I really appreciate your background and, and, and your story and how you are both venture capital and raising money as a venture capitalist and a founder. So would you mind just kicking us off? Tell us a little bit about your background. How did you how did you even get to this, this place where you're at now? Yeah, definitely. You know, back in 2012, I heard something about Silicon Beach here in Los Angeles. That's where I'm based. And I was just intrigued. You know, my former background is I used to be a financial advisor at Morgan Stanley and UBS. So that I did that when I was just a kid. And, you know, I was 24 during the start of the Great Recession. So, you know, I know what it's like to see the market crash like how it is now. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, been through an actual recession. And, you know, for me, it was a part in my life where it was so intriguing because in 2012, not only did I start doing angel investing, I also started taking over my family's business, which mm. is contract manufacturing. So that was kind of like my taste of getting into working for myself versus working for a Fortune 500 company, like, uh, you know, finances, or I was working at Cummins, you know, diesel engines and like mm -hmm. all that stuff mm -hmm. in, in Shanghai, China. But, you know, what got me intrigued was like, let's learn about startups, you know, and I made my first angel investment then, uh, you know, and actually made money in 10 months, unheard of. You know, because you don't make that much, that much, that right. quick money in venture that quick, right. you know, under a year. So I actually invested, you know, the money I invested in GIFT, G Y F T, into another company called Chow Now, which is doing great. And, you know, since then, I've probably done over 85 different deals from the pre seed to pre IPO for venture. I'm an LP in the probably 36 plus funds oh, and sure. not including my own. Yeah. So, and then 2018, after I get it, got my fourth and hopefully last, like, you know, degree, no more, unless it's an honorary one, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, I, uh, I started getting uh, into venture by, full time by, you know, starting a little fund with two friends of mine, Philip Serafin and Dave Lynn. It was called Unicorn Venture Partners. We started in 2018. It's done pretty well so far. You know, our current MOIC, you know, multiple investment capital is about almost 5.9. Pretty good. You know, and Great. and then a year after that, you know, Philip started his Evergreen family office called Truesdale Ventures, which I'm a partner at. And it's an amazing fund. We do a lot of great investments out of that. Uh, really, you know, it could be the smallest 50K check to a huge like $20 million check and a lot of different industries. And then right now I'm the stages of doing two things as well. I'm doing my own startup called Kitchen Data Systems. Uh, it's a restaurant tech B2B play helping uh you know, celebrities, influencers create their own restaurant brand, but at the same time, helping actual mom and pop restaurants save money. I'm actually in the KDS office now, and next door, they're having actually a discussion with Cisco and Integra to help save people money on their food. <laughs> so do it all. Yeah, and now also starting Grudge Ventures, my new little seed investing platform that I love to do. Awesome. Awesome. Wow. Okay. So you've seen a few things. Mm -hmm. All right. So entrepreneurial audience here tell us so wow so you've seen a lot of deals invested in a lot of deals from a variety oh, yeah. of different angles what was it that allowed what was it that sparked your interest in getting in the startup game yourself yeah you know it's like you know i've unfortunately had other startups that i was a co-founder of and you just learn the mistakes Right. I think some of the best people that I invest in, it's it's hard to find like, wow, like, you know, you hit it out of the park your first time around. You know, you got to go through a little struggle. Like every entrepreneur will tell you, like they live and breathe it 24 seven. This is something where it's not a nine to five job. If you want to work a nine to five job, you know, at a Fortune 500 company, that's great. Like more power to you. But it takes a different breed. 
to really do this. It's it's not fun. It's a lot of stress on yourself. Like you're not just like the CEO or co-founder. You know, you wear multiple hats day in, day out. And fortunate for me, what I learned along the way is you gotta have the right partners. I've had some bad partners in the past when I started startups or invested with other people. And now, like after doing this for 10 plus years, it's I know who I want to work with and who I don't want to work with and who I need to partner up with Mm. because I know what my strengths and weaknesses are. That's good. That's good. Okay. So tell us, tell us the origin story of the startup then. How, how did you get find into that? That's such an intriguing niche business that you have there. How, how did that come about? Yeah. With Kitch Data or KDS, it was like, I, I met my uh, co-founder and CEO, Mike Jacobs. You know, he was coming out of another startup that he founded called Ordermark, which now is known as NextBite as well. And he was doing something else. Uh, it was like a company called Grillo. It's like a service provider for helping people do like video, like animation or video promos or everything. But he started like, right, like probably like two months later, COVID happened. So it didn't work out, right? Nobody was going to actually do like, you know, videos and promotions and like all that stuff during that time. And so then, you know, his friend and brother is restaurant tech and food tech. And we, we thought about like, well, what can we do next? You know, and at that time, you know, the Dodgers were winning the World Series. We had a relationship there with the Dodgers and we started a company called Team Kitchens. Uh, Team Kitchens, basically, you sell Dodger dogs outside the stadium. So instead of actually having to, like, you know, go to Dodger Stadium to get the food, why not be a fan? And, and you know, throughout L.A., you can order the, the, the Dodger dogs at home while you're watching the game. Mm. And right now. You know, the Dodgers are in, you know, the playoffs again in 2022. Hopefully, knock on wood, you know, they'll they'll have a deep World Series playoff run. But that was a great partnership there. And then from there, we realized how hard it was to own and operate a restaurant. Like, we thought about, like, scaling that way. But it's so capital intensive. And we worked at, like, a cloud kitchen. We worked at other people's ghost kitchens. And it just wasn't the right fit. And from that, we pivoted into what we know Today is kitchen data systems. It was really about the software and what we can do to help restaurant owners save money on their food costs, but then also help. It's a two-sided marketplace. Help really entrepreneurs, restaurant, like you know, celebrities create their food brands. So we have a lot of great food brands that we're coming out with right now called Dancing Pizza, with you know professional dancers from Dancing with the Stars. So you think you can dance? We have Woo Wings with Ric Flair, you know, and it's his own like Woo Chicken Wing brand. You know, and we're probably in 25 different states right now, growing around 50 plus restaurants that we're working with, hopefully get to 100 by the end of the year. Fun, fun. So, okay. And then you're playing VC at the same time. Yep. Uh, there's, for, the, for the first time fund managers, right? They're emerging yep. fund managers listening in mm-hmm. that, are, that, are, that are taking their first swing. Obviously, this is a pretty interesting market to, to, to raise your first yep. fund in. But what advice do you have for people who are who are raising their first fund, like how do, how do you go about doing that? Yeah, I think the most important thing is you want to write LPs, right? And don't go crazy. Don't go for institutional investors right now. That's such a long time frame, and you have to have a track record. Like I think start conversations with them. But the most important thing right now is target really you know high net worth individuals or family offices or people who are willing to give you a shot. You know, I mean, whether, you know, you go after Mark Andreessen, I know he writes checks for first time, you know, founders, of course, all the time, but first time fund managers as well, because it's not about saying like, I need to get 25 million or a hundred million to have a fund. Like some of the best first time fund, all they raised like 5 million or 7 million, or even like, I know people who did $2 million. I gave them like a 50 K check, you know, one of my 36 like GPs. And you know what? Now they're raising 25, 50 million because it was just a track record. It's all about getting that track record. It's about your deal flow. That's unique to you. Like when I go out and go pitch like potential LPs, I'm telling them like, it's not because I know something about due diligence that no one else does. Right. It's like, I'm just like in the right ballparks, you know, I'm in the right fishing ponds. I mean, I'm just like right, right under the rim getting that rebound because I know where to go because I've done it. Like, you know, I think we're right or wrong, you know, like I love, you know, when people say like Warren Buffett's like has two rules, like rule one, don't lose money. Rule two, don't ever, don't forget rule one. And I'm like, <laughs> I think that's crazy. Cause like, I think every fund manager out there loses money. Yeah. But by losing money, you know, what you should and shouldn't do going forward. And then you see like all the weaknesses and then you find, oh, well, the companies that are not doing this and are doing it better and how they can pivot. And you find like there is some pattern recognition of what we do because it's not that like, oh, I'm going to do another social media company 
and call it like Facebook too. Like that's not going to work because the goalpost is so much farther away. So maybe you find something that's closer to you to execute better on to get to your series A. Because for me, I'm not a growth investor. I'm like an early stage investor. I like pre-seed to series A. I tell people anything under 30 million, you know, in valuation, that's where I think I could help you the most because I'm like a high school counselor. I want to get you to college. The college is that bigger series right. B check, series A right. check. That'll get you the growth that you need to really truly succeed. Right. But it takes a lot to get from zero to one. Like to go from zero to 100,000 revenue, it's a lot of work. It might take you, you might have to spend a million dollars just to get there. Right, right, right. Wow, okay, cool. Now, I, two questions, big, big, huge questions. One, around the current state of the market and how VCs and entrepreneurs should be thinking about that. And then I want to get into Crypto Web 3 stuff. Listen, there's always going to be macro events that affect the markets, right? Um, unless you're like, you know, you're a day trader. Yeah, that affects you. No question, right? But if you're thinking long term, if you're growing like, you know, next generational companies that are going to replace, you know, the Fortune 500, the S&P, like that's what people don't even think about. Like the S&P 500 changes every year. You know, you can change it every day, really, because like how the market goes up and down. But let's just say, take it year to year, it changes. So, you know, what was weird 15 years ago isn't weird today. Like I always like I always wanted to call my startup like uh, a fun, uh, weird venture. You know, because like it would have been weird 15 years ago to get in somebody's random car at the airport or to stay on someone's air mattress. But those two companies, Uber and Airbnb, came out of the Great Recession. You know, right. they were founded right before, you know, the Obama administration in 2008. Right. And look at where they are now. Like they're, they're, just, they're, they're nouns or verbs, you know, and we are just used to it because some of the best companies are created when times are tough because, listen, you're going to find better entrepreneurs. You're going to find like, it's not, it's easy just to get like, you know, money right. in the door to go like spend ridiculously. Like I would say this, like D to C totally different business than it was three years mm -hmm. ago now, mm -hmm. because like you can't just go spend money on Facebook and Google, you right. know, and we'll go into your web three questions. But, like web three, I think that's the big change for web two to web three is like, how do you acquire customers now? How do you get that community? That sense of we, instead of just me looking through like all these Instagram posts. <laughs> okay. Well, that's a beautiful tee up. And actually a lens, right? There's a thousand different ways to approach the, the Web3 conversation. Let's approach it with your exact tee up there. Like how, how does it change the game? How should entrepreneurs be thinking about it from a, from a community and customer acquisition perspective yeah. as, as you enter the Web3 conversation? I think what's so important is understanding who your audience is and who your community is. You know, uh, you, you see it like even today, like big companies like Starbucks and McDonald's, like they're changing the game of how they're you know approaching their reward systems. Right. Every time you go to McDonald's now, it's like, hey, are you ordering with your app or the rewards program? Like that, you didn't hear that, like, you know, six months ago, but they're pushing on that to get that data, you know, instead of like buying it through a Facebook ad or a Google ad or just spending like on a, you know, a billboard or a TV commercial. It's like they want to get that basically data point from their customers directly. And so and then and, and people want to give that willingly not just be sold because hey they signed up for a gmail or a youtube account you know what's important now is like a brand whether it's a startup or you know amazon or walmart some of the biggest companies in the world there has to be that relationship that is is defined well which could be through crypto could be through nfts but there's some source of tech that is involved that will you know really make that relationship stronger you know, you hear about DeFi, you hear about like DAOs, you know, like, yeah, those are those are ways of doing it. But that's just part of Web3. Web3 isn't just like, oh, you're part you have, you're part of this club because you have a board ape. Like, it's, it's more than that, in mm -hmm. my opinion. It's really building a sense of community now and really wanting to choose to be part of it. And it's not just offline. It's in, in real life, too. I think really there's going to be a lot of like in-person events as well, like get togethers that you just don't sit there and just look at your phone all day. Right, right. So how, dis how disruptive do you think Web3 is going to be? I mean, it, it, there's a lot of hype, a lot of futurists claiming that this is going to be take over everything. How much does adding a blockchain, uh, obviously I have very strong opinions about this, but I'm curious <laughs> what you think. Uh, how much does a blockchain change the game? I think it also depends on like 
the generation you're, you're, you're dealing with, right? Mm. Like my mom isn't going to all of a sudden like ask me to set up a, a, a Coinbase wallet for her to like store NFTs in, you mm. know? Mm. It, it's like, like my dad used to use AOL. The day he died, he used his, you know, DH, mm. whatever, that AOL, David Hung, <laughs> you know, AOL.com. He wasn't right. going to get a Gmail. You know, so it's like, how do you and I communicate? Like, I listen, I just like using iMessage, right? Or maybe WhatsApp. Some like younger people than me love using TikTok, love using Snapchat. So like, I think they're going to be like, you're going to use maybe blockchain, you're going to use these days of, you know, like in crypto world, they would use Telegram or Signal, right? They wouldn't like be caught dead on WhatsApp, <laughs> right? Investors. You know, so that's really intriguing too. So I like, it's going to be the type of technology, whether it's blockchain or something else that's totally created, that's new through Python or whatever, that people are going to really resonate with a, a generation or a group or a community. Like I said, I think it's really about the community and not just the tech. So your B2B uh, uh, kitchen business is absolutely mm -hmm. fascinating. And what how, are you thinking of anything Web3 oriented on that angle? Yeah. Or or you are. Yeah, absolutely. Because there is types of like, you know, we're partnering up with like Harmony blockchain, you know, for example, and it's just like the idea of like, okay, you're Ric Flair or you're a wrestler or you're some sort of celebrity. And it's like, listen, like, how are we going to get that data from you? How are you going to like understand who you are as a customer? Well, listen, we're going to give you like a, a mint you a free NFT that you could do whatever you want with it. But it's like, it's a way of like, hey, we're going to say like, you know, if you buy through this nft that you hold or this like rewards program basically it's a rewards program like we're going to identify you as a super fan you know of this influencer and then we're going to maybe have like you know giveaways you know opportunities for like you know just a, a facetime call you know things of that nature that's just part of the marketing to make you want to keep buying you know from your favorite celebrity i mean that's really that's the way of like truly owning that data and that connection because right now if you're ordering off a of doordash and uber eats you don't like me as an influencer, for example, not that I am one, I don't know who's buying. I know the sales are coming in. And I'm going to get money from that, but I don't actually know who he or she is actually purchasing mm. my hamburger or my bur or my pizza. But this is a way of collecting that data and being able to truly engage with your fans and knowing who they are. Because they're going to, hey, if you're going to sign up for that NFT, I'm going to need your like information. Like where am I going to send you, you know, your prize? I need your address or I need your email or a phone number. Ah, so you collect more. Yeah, you're right. Because you're not but, usually collecting yeah. that because they're, uh, they're not allowed based on credit card data or whatever to extract that Are merchants allowed to extract that or what do you, are you familiar with kind of how, how that would even they look? they keep that information, but they don't have to provide that to you because you're using their platform. Right. So if you're a if you're a restaurant or something, or, mm -hmm. or even just a, a food truck, you're are you allowed yeah. to collect the the name? I guess you don't you might have their name and their address you're not are you allowed to like send people mailings based on collecting their address from credit card data that they buy at your food truck i don't know if i've ever thought about no this no you're, you're really you're really not yeah you're you, not. you sign like you're not you're not allowed to do that right you you have to you as a user have to approve that right but you but when you sign on to use a credit card or you sign on to use uber eats there's all that legalities that you say yeah you check the box and you say yeah get let me in right Got but it. That's that's part of it, right? This is another way of like for the influencer to say, listen, but that's part of it, you know. There's, it's not like oh, the whole company is built on blockchain and Web three, you know. It, it's it's just a small piece of it because I think even Starbucks, right? Their whole rewards program, they're right. changing it. They're talking about blockchain and what they're gonna do, and there's gonna be like you know NFTs or whatever. Yeah, that's gonna be part of it, no question. You know, like I was reading today, like uh, uh, one of my schools, like UPenn, is working on their first NFT. Like why? Like, but, you know, it's just like they're working on it, right? That they're going to like issue. And maybe like every actual alumni or student that comes forward, like that proves that they went there. I don't know. You know, yeah. it's, just, it's just like a public data. Yeah. The different use cases for public databases. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. So now what areas are you, uh, obviously you have your startup, but what areas as an investor, if you put your investor hat on, yeah, what are you interested? Like what verticals? What 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 areas? What what are the what are the things that you're looking at uh, next on the horizon here that you want to want to allocate money toward? Listen, I still love you know B two B companies. You know, I understand enterprise SaaS businesses. It's a different multiple. It's a different understanding of how you acquire customers, and and, and enterprise business is totally different than the consumer. I actually think like I might be a little bit more knowledgeable 
in, in B2C and a little D2C because of my background running contract manufacturing business, working with retailers, understanding supply chain. So, and it's a different way. So like, I really love those two verticals. You know, I still look, obviously look at Web3 um, and, and crypto, but those are just like a little bit more ancillary to like the core. Because I think for me, what I'm good at are those two sectors. And listen, there's going to be other things like the things I've invested in the past, like Solugen, it's a chemicals company. Like I was very fortunate to be in LP and Refractor Capital. I got, you know, they invested in their seed round and I learned more of it. And I got into like later stage rounds, right? It's all about like finding the right opportunities because it's not like saying like, oh, I'm looking... I think it's weird when it's like, I'm only investing in crypto web free gaming companies. Like that puts you in such a weird box because you don't know what timing is sometimes, right? Like if you did that, like before this year, oh yeah, you killed it. But right now during crypto winter, it's just like, Ooh, like what are you going to invest in right now? Right. Like what growth? It's like, it's all about timing for me. And like, Fortunately for me in the past, I haven't had to deal with that because it's been my family office or my friend's family office. And we don't have like, you know, a 10 year horizon or three year investment window that we have to invest. Like right now, there's so many funds out there with money that haven't been able to deploy anything yet because they're mm. just holding out. But sooner or later, based on their investment thesis and their time frame, they're going to have to like allocate out. And right now, we're just waiting to see who's going to survive. You know, there's all these companies that are struggling right now to raise money but that's really because money's on the sideline right now because they're just willing to see who really is able to survive without you know free money so for the hundreds of thousands of celebrities that watch this show (laughs) if they want to get in on your kitchen action what what can they do where do they go hey come take a look at at my website jonathanhung.com hit me up on linkedin it's great but, you know, if you want, please, you can, for the kitchen data systems, like it's John, J-O-N at kitchdata.com. You know, I'm the one who found the domain, Kitch Data, so I'm very proud of that. <laughs> not the .com, not a .co. <laughs> That's great. That's great. All right. So final question for the young entrepreneurs listening in. They're getting going. Maybe they got like side hustles are all the rage these days, right? Oh, People are just yeah. trying to figure stuff out. What advice yeah. do you have? for them i think the most important thing is don't do it alone mm-hmm. like you know i've gone to mit i've gone to ward and i've met with like some people who are like type a's right who are you know great in their field super intellectual but i think if you're going to be in a startup if you want to be an entrepreneur it's about about team building look at elon musk it wasn't elon musk buying all of twitter himself like, I think it's really clear now that like he was going to ask a lot of his friends to help finance it, you know? So that's the way of every thing in this world is who your friends are and who you want to partner with. And I think like, that's the most important. Like there are no just solo GPs out there. We have, I have like con- connected so many like great other GPs in my network that I speak to, that I talk to like, Hey, do, what do you think of this idea? You know, I always tell people this, like I might be known for this forever, but like I turned down Robin Hood in the very beginning of my investment career because right. I didn't understand it. At 20 million valuation, you pretend to buy and sell, you know, stock, you know, and it's a fantasy game. Like, I don't get that. What kind of game would you play being a financial advisor in the past? And it was just stupid of me because like, hey, it was actually a data play, you know, and look where they are now. You know, whether whether you believe in Robin Hood, what it is, good or bad, you know, getting at 20 million would have made me and my friends a lot of money, you know, but that right. was me not knowing in 2013. So what if I had other great people? around the table with me. Now I do, and I can talk. Like there's a company right now I'm looking at, you know, that does peer to peer gambling, you know? And it's like gambling, I think is here to stay. I don't think it's like gonna be like, we're all gonna outlaw it all of a sudden. Right. So for me, it's like, okay, I think like, how can we get this company better? Like I have a company that I work with now that does like uh, buying lottery tickets, you know, through an app or on a web base. And I just connected them. I'm gonna connect those two, this founder I've already invested and someone I might invest in just to see, because now I have this network, like any entrepreneur out there who wants to do a VC or start a company, like get help, get friends. That's the only way. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, this is a great, great conversation. And besides the, what you the, what you pointed to before, what are the best yeah. ways for people to get a hold of you? Yeah, uh, just definitely LinkedIn, I think is a great okay. tool, you know, and also, yeah. you know, hit me up on my website, jonathanhung.com. There's an email. You can reach me there at, and there's, I, love, I do a lot of blog posting there. Awesome. Awesome. This is great. Jonathan, really appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Thank you, Will.
All right, a couple quick things before you go. Number one, I have a general newsletter where I write about technology and startups and health science and teaching people to code. And I write about a variety of different subjects that we talk about on this show. So if you go to wclittle.com, there you'll be able to subscribe. And you'll also be able to subscribe to particular topics. If you're just interested in one or a few of them, you'll be notified right when I publish new content in those areas. Number two, my partners and I at Proto Ventures have a portfolio company called Startup Rocket. If you go to startuprocket.com, there you'll be able to receive coaching guides and customize an operations framework for you and your team and your advisors to be on the same page in terms of what is the appropriate next step for you and your entrepreneurial journey. And finally, if you wouldn't mind leaving a review anywhere that you have listened to this podcast or watched this podcast, it would be super helpful to help those who might be interested in consuming this content as well. Thank you.